Welcome to the REI Diamonds Show with Dan Breslin, your source for real estate investment jewels of wisdom. Welcome to the REI Diamond Show. I'm your host, Dan Breslin, and this is episode 127 with Zach Beach on 100 lease option deals in just three years. You might remember an episode we did last year with Chris Prefontaine on this same topic. In fact, I believe he even mentioned Zach on that episode. Anyway, we discuss a strategy here for doing deals with near retail or even slightly above retail sellers. That means price and condition with properties in decent condition at least. Uh, then running those deals to completion for a total profit potentially in the six-figure range with nearly no money out of pocket. So that is a lower risk situation and strategy for those of you paying attention. This is not a no money out of pocket because he's using a private lender situation either, but rather a low risk, longer term strategy of doing deals over the course of time, properly managing the deal itself is where he's adding value, that is the seller and the buyer for time periods of two to four years to ultimately cashing out of the deal and making a five to six figure payday in closing. If you did catch Chris's episode, this one is still worth your time to listen, I promise. We talk about a variety of subjects here, so we might as well get right to it, shall we? All right, welcome to the show, Zach. How are you doing today? I'm doing excellent, Dan. Thank you for having me on. I uh, hope I can bring your audience of value and, and looking forward to this this chat that we're going to have. For sure. And for our listeners, we had Chris Prefontaine on a little while back and Chris and Zach are, it's family, correct? Yeah, we're a family business. Yep. They focus on the lease option a, a topic, owner finance, seller finance, and some it's some pretty creative ways. And I actually got into a deal like right now, I'm in the process of contracting it using the strategy that I'm sure we'll touch on a bit today, but that Chris certainly touched on. So for listeners who remember Chris, we're going to get into some of that same, you know, topic and subject matter. And I believe we even mentioned your name on Chris's show. So I'll put a link in the notes to that. But for everybody who hasn't heard your name already and maybe didn't hear Chris's episode, could you give the background and how you got started, how you got into real estate and a brief, you know, description of what your business is today, Zach? Sure. Yeah. No, I'd love to, Dan. Yeah. So when I got out of college, I uh, was a bartender and a personal trainer, and uh, I did that for uh, a bunch of years. And, and we lived down here in Newport, Rhode Island, which is a great place to to be a bartender. But eventually, I was kind of burning the candle at both ends because I was serving people drinks at night, and then I was training those exact same people the next morning <laughs> at five o'clock in the morning to help them to help them burn off those calories. So, uh, as you can imagine, you know, living on short hours of sleep eventually gets to you. So. Uh, when I was about 20, coming on about 25, I went to Chris. Chris is my father-in-law, so um, I married his daughter. He recently started his his new venture in real estate. So I went to him and I said, hey, you know, I don't know if I'm going to like real estate. I don't even know if this is going to like be good. But uh, but I figured I would reach out to you because, you know, I know that, that me learning this real estate skill is, is going to be a heck of a lot better than uh, than bartending for the next year or so. So... What then happened is, um, you know, I joined the family business. Nothing was guaranteed. We just recently at that time started a, a coaching program, and we also have been doing uh, a lot of transactions, lease options, owner financing, subject to deals. Uh, but, you know, it wasn't like I was walking into a salary or anything. So it was, you know, in my mind, it was a little bit of a risky move there. But, you know, I hopped into the business, um, you know, fast forward three years later with the help of my family team, I, the partners are me, Chris, and my brother-in-law, Nick, with a fantastic support team. But fast forward about three years later, you know, uh, with the help of my team and associates around the country, I've done well over 100 plus deals and counting. And like I said, I started with absolute zero experience. Uh, so if anybody's out there that is just getting started in real estate, there is hope. Just you just got to put your, put your uh, head down and get running. Cool. Just to paint a little backstory. So one of my misconceptions was that well, let me like share my own history. So I started off, I was broke. Uh, I got in the business in 2006. I was wholesaling, I was flipping houses. And 
I was kind of spoon fed the Kool Aid of like, oh, you got to buy rentals, and rentals is the key to wealth. And so I'd be like trying to get rental properties. And I heard so much information so, from so many directions. And I would just try them all without really landing on anything and tried myself. I didn't have a ton of money, didn't have access to money. And I would, I would be, find myself gravitating toward the lease option, sandwich lease option or seller finance strategy, but I would get the hang up because I didn't really have money to like cover a mortgage payment and and I didn't want to disappoint a seller. So it it never really worked out for me. I'm at a different spot now and something like uh, the owner finance, if I've got to make a year worth of payments to a seller who entrusted me with their property because I have a tenant go bad or something of that nature, like I'm prepared to cover that, you know, at the drop of a hat, it's not going to be any issue. I mean, our business model, just so you know, Zach, is flipping houses and we do like 200 deals per year and we use private money to fund those deals. And it's kind of a straightforward, standard, old fashioned house flipping and wholesaling company where it's clean and and our sellers are getting their solution from us in like a 30 to 45 day period. So the timeline and relationship with our seller is, is, I imagine, much shorter than what you're going to describe here on some of your deals. That said, would you mind kind of taking us through one of the good deals, something sexy, something that sounds exciting, that gets people's attention, one of your favorite deals, hopefully it's one of your most profitable ones, but just to kind of paint the picture of what one of these seller finance or these lease option deals looks like from your perspective. Yeah, no, um, um, thank you definitely for that background. I appreciate that. And yeah, I'd be more than happy to to walk you through a, a, a deal of ours. As you mentioned, uh, owner financing, of course, the way we set these up are probably the sexiest deals that we come across uh, because we want to take title. So just to kind of give you a, a quick spread on, on the types of deals we do, first and foremost, um, a lease purchase, really simple. It just means that we're agreeing upon a price with a seller today. We're then locking in their equity today. I'm then going to take over any and all responsibilities, so mortgage, maintenance, taxes, insurance any and all future repairs, any and all responsibilities. And then we have a definitive end date on it before that end date. We'll cash them out, and then we'll give them their equity. So delayed cash sale in, in a way. But if you want sexy, then I'll give you owner financing. I bought a property, owner financing. We bought a property, owner financing, in um, over here in Connecticut, because we're in southern New England. And um, what we ended up scripting up was we bought a property. Uh, I'll give you some rough numbers. We bought a property for roughly 400000 we then closed on it. Uh, we then took title. We crafted up $1,000 a month principal only payments. So you heard that right. It's not interest only, it's principal only payments. That's the only way we buy owner financing as we're always working to leveraging ourselves against the market and uh, creating some really big spreads on the back end. So we then have to pay ourselves $1,000 a month principal only payments plus taxes and insurance. And then there's really cool nuance on the back end as well. So then we uh, we placed a tenant buyer in the property, so we bought the property um, for 48 months as a balloon payment. So $1,000 principal line payments, 48 months balloon payment. We then placed a tenant buyer in the property. That's who we typically work with. So someone who's looking to become a homeowner, they just need time in order to become mortgage ready. So you're talking someone who's probably self-employed that needs time for seasoning or somebody who had a legitimate hiccup in their credit and just needs time in order to repair it. This buyer happened to be someone who was a contractor. They had a payment company. Uh, came in with $20,000 down for a, they, we placed them in a property for a 24 month term. Um, we raised the premium on that price, say from 400,000 to 420,000. And then we're collecting a monthly spread on that house of roughly, I think it's roughly $300 a month. So I don't, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I know that this property, if it goes the full 48 month term, which hopefully it doesn't, but if it does and we get it cashed out, it's going to be well over six figures. And that was little to no money down on the property. I think we paid the transfer fees. And then the really cool, sexy part on top of this is there is a house. Uh, they have, there's a garage and there's a, there's a suite above it, which we have a renter in it. That brings us an additional $700 worth of cash flow every single month as well, which again adds to, adds to the, uh, the back end, which is going to be, like I said, it's easily going to be a six-figure deal. I uh, was a little to no money down. Okay, so was that strike price on that four hundred and twenty thousand to the contractor who's living there now? Yeah, so we would typically buy it at say 
we'd always raise a premium on the house. So let's say if we bought at four hundred thousand, we would at least raise it to say four twenty. Uh, because all of our buyers are, they're basically locking in their price today as well. So it's fantastic for them as well because as the market continues to appreciate, they're actually going to get some equity when they cash out as well. So we're always driving incentives to get them to become homeowners. Unlike maybe some other gurus you've heard out there or so-called gurus out there or people teaching things where you just place a tenant buyer on the property, collect an arm funnel deposit, and who cares if they, they succeed. Uh, completely different on our model. As you can imagine, we're a family business, so we're always looking to help out people and to actually create a solution. So we put some really strict, really strict steps in place that will actually get people cashed out and create homeowners. This is interesting. So they pay down. Let's just say the guy goes, you know, 24 months. Uh, that's your profits kind of building up in this in the fact that that thousand dollar a month payment is paying down the principal. And then you got the 300 a month, which is nothing to write home about. Uh, but you also have that 700 a month back there. And, and the uh, contractor eventually, I guess, he's got his eye on that tenant and he's counting the days and he's paying his credit card bills on time to when that tenant's going to be paying him that 700 bucks and he's the actual owner of the property. He's incentivized to do that particularly well in this deal. I'm writing it down and I'm assuming that that is the pay down on the principal of a thousand plus the 20,000 he collected up front. And then he's coming in and he, he gets credit for that 20,000. Yeah. Yep. But no yep. monthly credit as time's going on nope. for any pay down. Nope. So then. Nope. Just rent. Gotcha. Rent plus taxes and insurance. So they take over the property hundred percent like they own it, except they are just paying a lease payment. Uh, because if we were giving them principal pay down, then what would you know? What would incentivize them to go get their loan? Yeah, exactly. So the four hundred thousand dollar house in today's market, whenever it was, it might have been a year ago. I, I'm not sure, but you know, for the sake of the example, that price is locked in. What would that house have sold for, in your opinion, looking at the market with a real estate agent today, in the condition that it was in, had this seller chosen to go that route instead of through you? Yeah, today it might have sold for maybe. 390 or yeah it's, we didn't give them any huge premium on the property which um uh, i would say based upon my comps and again I, I don't have the deal right in front of me and i actually now i'm looking at i think we sold it for a heck of a lot more i think we sold it for like 430 or 440 um but i would say the property would have appraised for it and or sold for right around 400,000 today yeah and, and i ask because we're painting the picture of like our sellers in, in our business models act like we're looking it, it's the best fit when somebody has a distressed property and it needs a new kitchen it needs new work i mean if the thing's got a skylight but it's not a skylight it's just that the roof wore a hole and it like <laughs> caved it that's a good fit that's like our function in the market you know and, and it's like we're running around making these offers and sometimes one of our offers gets in front of a homeowner who has this house and it's not a good fit, and he's probably offended, and it's probably giving guys like me a bad name in the marketplace when that happens, and it's not really the greatest matchup. Um, I I'm assuming the condition was good as I make that statement. Could you elaborate on the condition of this property as you guys took it? I'm assuming rent re uh, retail-ready, certainly like rent-ready condition, right? Oh, absolutely. Yep. So all the properties were, the, you know, most properties that we buy are, um, nice move in ready condition, uh, no issues. We don't, we, we focus on, I guess what people would call like pretty homes. So we're always looking for nice move in ready properties. More than willing to pay roughly about what market value is today, uh, because we are going to be able to sell it for a premium because we are talking like longer term deals. Um, and as the market continues to appreciate that, that's where the equity gets built up, not only for us, but also for, but for the uh, buyers as well. Uh, so yeah, nice move in ready homes. Um, don't have to don't have to touch them. Gotcha. So I'm waiting on a contract back on one of my deals right now, Zach. And it's a 10 unit building. The cash flow is is strong enough for me to buy it. I'm 1031ing out of another property, so it's more the conventional route. But we were twenty thousand yep. dollars off in price, and I wanted it for whatever six fifty, including you know the five grand to the guy that brought me the deal. And the seller was stuck, I think, at six sixty five, give or take including the guy's 5,000. So his 20,000 was still on the table and, and he suggested, oh yeah, you know, the seller carry. And I was like, fine, but no interest. Half expecting people yeah. to come back, oh no, I want interest and raise a, a fit. 
Um, they didn't raise a fit. They, they instead, uh, I offered $500 a month, no interest until the 20,000 was paid off. They didn't say anything about the no interest. That wasn't the pushback, but they asked for 800 a month instead. That leaves me net, you know, not a ton of cash flow left over in the deal, but like, I don't care to have the 20,000 paid down pretty quick at $800 a month by the property and have the use of the $20,000 now instead of having to put that up or even borrow money at 5 or 6 or 7%. I've just started to learn as I, I become more experienced in the real estate business, the power of time uh, against the money and the interest rates and the pay down and things like that. But that 0% pushback at 800 that I agreed to, in my mind, I could hear Chris, you know, telling me, oh, yeah, you know, they, you do this principal only thing. And my first reaction is, oh, any seller is going to want an interest rate. So how do you deal with that? Like when this guy's like, well, no, I want an interest rate. Or does that not even come up on your deals? I mean, how do you get over that hurdle and objection with sellers? First of all, it's all positioning. When you when you have a standard of way of doing business, they don't know that, you know, they, they don't know any other differences. And I say that because I'm only offering them principal only payments. I'm not offering them, hey, I'll do principal only payments on this option and maybe I'll do some interest on this option. Like once you position like this is the standard way of how we do business, then they don't know any other way. Um, but I, of course, we've, we've all been questioned on that. And I always tell them this one thing. I say, well, the way we normally do is I pay you principal only payments. I'm going to pay you, you know, full price today or at least fair market value today. So you're actually going to be able to receive that entire amount. So if I actually gave you an option where I paid interest, then on those interest payments, you're going to have to collect or you're going to have to pay taxes on that, which means that you're not going to get that entire amount. Um, so instead, what I would do is I would position those right next to each other and I would say, okay, well, I'm going to pay you full market value and maybe I'll even pay you a slight premium or I pay you, I take you slight money off the purchase price and then I offer the interest because they can't get both. They can't get full market value and get interest on the house. It's just, there's going to be some give and take. So when I position those two next to each other, they're clearly going to see that they're going to net a heck of a lot more if they take the principal only payments. So most people choose it. Yeah. I mean, if I just I do the calculation all- here, uh, let's just say 400000 same deal. The guy goes, hires a real estate agent, even off of Redfin, 1%, and they got to pay 3% to the other side. So at 4%, we're looking at sixteen grand. So, like, would the guy collect sixteen grand, give or take, in interest? I mean, he would have to pay that to the agent, but yet he's not even having to pay that, let alone repair credits, let alone going through the inspection and having to do this, this, and this, maybe potentially to the house. I mean, it's reasonable to expect a guy like that, you know, being at three ninety with a little bit of negotiation and everything. I mean, he could be twenty five, thirty thousand dollars net less than doing it your way. And I didn't even bring up the interest either. I'm just kind of like thinking through the guy's motivation to take the deal, right? Exactly. Uh, 100%. This happened to be a a guy that lived out in Indiana. Uh, it was a family uh, family home of theirs for forever. So it was a pretty clear property and and uh, they just, they weren't using it anymore. So they got this house that's sitting in Connecticut and they live in Indiana. Uh, and then we bring up these options like, hey, and it actually was on the market and expired, I think once or twice, because uh, they weren't able to, um, they weren't able to be there to, to help with the showings and make sure it was all set. So instead, you know, we came in, gave him a fair price, offered principal only payments, gave him a solution, which is what we do. It's, it's, hey, we have this creative solution on which I can get you from A to B. Uh, as long as you don't need all of the equity today, then we can help you maximize your profit. Eliminate, uh, you know, more eliminate with your mortgage relief and take away um, mortgage payments, take away maintenance on a house, eliminate landlordship. So a bunch of those things that we can help, and it's really just finding out, hey, can can this particular seller uh, be a good fit for our options? And if they can, then that's how, that's how we get deals done. Cool. So let's talk about the rest, right? We just, you know, we did the living room, we did the front end. You found the deal, expired listing. You call him, you know, his circumstances matched up, you're the solution. But now let's talk about the relationship that potentially happens for 48 months after the contract paperwork and the deed is signed. Do you have any process for, you know, babysitting, handling, maybe some nightmares or things that happen that other people could avoid 
for that like long term yeah. relationship with the seller, and also now you have a tenant in place too. So could you just kind of touch on that? Yeah. So obviously, yeah, the front end is acquiring properties and being more transactional. That back end is selling the properties and being more transactional. But of course, with lease purchase, owner financing, or, or when you're having these long-term deals and you have a tenant buyer in the place, you need to make sure that you have systems and processes set up in order to, number one, collect the payment. And then also if there's a mortgage on the property or you're paying the seller to then pay the payment. Uh, so you're going to make sure that you have systems for collection and payment. You're also going to make sure that you have systems in place and checkpoints to make sure that these tenant buyers are, number one, going through credit repair or credit enhancement, whatever they, whatever they need, because that's all part of um, this entire process, because we, we need to help them get financing. Uh, we need to make sure that we have additional resources uh, within our processes in order to get them in touch with a mortgage lender or whatever other resources that they need. And then also... We need to make sure that we have some checks and balances for, okay, well, what happens if they don't pay on time? What happens then? If they need to go through an eviction process because somebody decided that they weren't going to make payments anymore, a life happened, life event happened, and they decided they weren't going to make payments. Uh, they lose their non-refundable deposit, but we also have checks and balances in place for, okay, well, well how do we handle the eviction process? Who needs to be where and uh, which attorney are we working with? Um, so there's really, and it, it, it sucks that that happens, right? When somebody comes in, looks to buy a house, puts up an honor funnel deposit, and then eventually something happens and then they default. Uh, and they have to either go through the eviction process or just give up their deposit and move on, which is 99% of the time. It's rare that we go through an eviction process. But that also making sure that when we're doing turnover, just like anybody, any other property management company, you got to make sure that when you're doing turnover, like if somebody's leaving, you have a vacancy just to make sure that you're you're making sure that all those boxes are checked, like making sure heat's on. I don't, you know, some people are in different areas of the country, but say in the Northeast, you got to make sure heat's on. You got to make sure that the property's being managed, oil's in the tank or gas. You just each and every little piece of of managing a property needs to come into play. And if you just don't have those checks and balances set up, then something can easily slip. Um, just because it's real estate, right? And, and you're dealing with people. Yeah, real estate is a highly intensive management investment. I mean, it's almost shouldn't be called an investment. It's more like a business. You're in the business of real estate and people are investing in real estate. It's almost like the wrong terminology in some sense. Do you guys use outside management companies? You're doing deals all over the country. How do you make sure that all the details are, you know, dotted I's and cross T's? Sure. So uh, locally in our in our buy and sell LLC, which is, so we have two different pieces of the business. And one is we're still in the trenches. We still buy and sell property each and every month locally for our personal family business. But then also we, we lock arms with what we call associates and we help them through our smartrealestatecoach.com. We help them buy and sell homes and set up their business just like we are. So we're kind of like the guinea pigs. And then we teach people how to use it uh, and how to build and scale their business throughout the country. So if we're in different parts of the country, then we have a local associate who's building their business just like ours. Um, so we're not necessarily worrying about managing that. As far as here locally, uh, we do use property management companies if needed. Uh, on some, some properties, we do have some long-term rentals or like I was telling you earlier, we do have like a college rental. Um, those are just different exit strategies that you can use. We buy the same. We just sell different on occasion. Um, but yeah, property management company if needed. Or we have our own like internal, uh, we have our internal per, uh, point person who runs everything, makes sure everything's collected. And then we have like an online database system. Uh, it's called Appfolio that kind of runs all the properties. So it's all online management. Yeah, Appfolio is great. I, I learned about Appfolio from my property manager and I get the, you know, the statements and everything. And that works well. For me, I've never seen the backside of it, but all of a sudden I'm hearing that pop up again and again on my show, on other podcasts I listen to. That's interesting that you guys are also using that to manage your inventory. You mentioned the associates, Zach, and I yep. know I don't do any coaching and people reach out to me every once in a while looking for that. I just don't have time. I'm buried in doing the podcast and managing 
the activity. Yeah. I, sh I should probably be handing more stuff off to my two additional team members that aren't here, but I always feel like I'm still evolving all of our processes and making it better, not quite ready to hand it all off. Uh, that's a totally different conversation for another time and day. <laughs> but uh, I think it's cool what you and Chris and, and you guys are doing there, Smart Real Estate Coach, because you are you know, making yourself available and kind of bringing other people up to speed. What is your perfect avatar? Who's the kind of person that reaches out to you and becomes a successful associate? What did they do before? You know, what is their life situation like? Is there a certain age of, of people or experience or, or anything that if someone's listening and they're like, you know what, these lease options are great. And I was thinking I might reach out, you know, what qualifications maybe or characteristics should a person like that have who's going to succeed or could expect to succeed highly at what you're doing? Yeah. So I don't want to limit it down to just like a type A personality, but I would say the type A personalities tend to get, tend to get along with us uh, a lot just because we all are all weird. The family is, I don't want to call us crazy, but we're very high energy, New England, born and raised in Massachusetts. So uh, very blunt to the point. So like a type A, someone who's like looking to be really serious at, at, uh, at building a business, not only just getting transactional, but actually uh, building a business. Our best associates tend to come from maybe someone with slight real estate experience. Maybe they come from a different avenue of real estate. I know our top associate, so someone who's done the most deals with us is located in D.C. He's actually 71, but he was in commercial real estate for about 25 years. That's not everyone, but let's say that. And then we have we have our uh, other one of our other top associates who's coming out of he's actually out in California and he's in the produce business. So he works like I don't know 16 hour days for like a season at a time uh, because it's so crazy and they're doing all of their profits at that time. And he still is finding time in order to create this business. He's also like 34 or 36. So two different spectrums here, but the the commonality is. They're 100% go-getters. Um, they're really good at, you know, taking or at being coachable. So as soon as I'm, we make a critique, you know, they're changing up their process and they're and they're and they're going after it. So um, definitely type A, someone who's serious, looking to become a uh, real estate investor, somebody who's either had some prior real estate experience, even though, like I said, myself came from nothing, more than willing to work with you, or has or has some sort of background as far as training, meaning maybe they've gone through other programs before. They haven't found the, the niche quite ready for them. Um, uh, we get a lot of people that have gone through other people's programs and then don't realize that they need more hands-on training. And we have the ability to do that. Not much other uh, real estate coaching companies have that ability, but because we have that unique family aspect, you don't just join like Chris or Zach or Nick. You join Zach, Nick, Chris, plus our support team, plus our associate network, plus our associate community. Um, so you really are surrounded by people that are getting deals done constantly, and you have a constant network of, of being able to, say, pull on strings in order to help you accomplish deals. So I could continue to name things off, but I think those are those are the type of people that tend to succeed. Yeah, so my, like I think I mentioned earlier, you know, I came from nothing and wholesaling, becoming a source of deals was a humongous and still is a humongous reason why Diamond Equity Investments, our team, is successful and why I was able to succeed was because I learned how to go out there and get deals. And there were different deals than the ones you're talking about now. I can remember my own fear, like I said, to do these kind of deals just because of my limited resources. And like my experience back then was like, Oh man, I'm glad that lease ended so I can move back with family because I can't afford to pay it for another year. And like that was my life experience at 26. I really didn't have this like nice string of success. That's definitely not the case anymore. And for people listening, I, I know wholesaling works out well. And I offer, you know, there's people who come to us through the podcast, they have deals, they dig up direct with seller. And they mention it in the, the comment box there that comes directly to me. And I respond to them. And either me or one of the people on my team will work the wholesale lead. We'll buy the property from them and we'll pay them out a wholesale fee. Or sometimes we'll kind of like take the ball and run with it. 
and pay them out and let them kind of like ride coattails with us on that deal and they can see how it's done. And that's the extent of how I mentor people is kind of like coaching them along through some direct to seller negotiations, you know, when they come to me and they have something of value. And to me, something of value is the connection and the introduction with the seller who wants to sell property for us the more distressed conditionally or the faster they need to sell it, the better that's where it's going to be a good fit. Um, and, and that works out well. There's people who started wholesaling doing that, bringing some deals to us and kind of grew and now are flipping houses and doing kind of the business themselves. And maybe they're at a point where, to me, it sounds like you'd kind of want a little bit of momentum to really succeed at the lease option. And in my mind, I'm thinking, Zach, I got – like 12,000 leads in my system for Chicago and I've got like 7,000 leads in Atlanta and I'm thinking of like a ton of deals where, you know, taking over the payments, these principal only seller and these lease options and, and so many of these creative deals would have worked, but we haven't had the time to sit down and try to, you know, do the process and we've watched in Atlanta houses we could have locked in, you know, for 250,000, they're worth 325 three years later, like on the real market and we can sell them. And I'm knowing, I'm thinking we missed an opportunity. So I'm, I'm getting around to the question is, what does it look like? You don't have to give me, you know, the coaching costs. I'm sure there's a, an upfront cost to make sure people are serious. But what does that business arrangement look like for an associate? Is there a, a deal split? Is there a number of deals they kind of split? You know, how much is the split? Uh, and what does that look like for one of, you know, the 71 year old guy? Is he going to do business with you forever? Or is there a certain point where he kind of takes the training wheels off and he's on his own? Yeah, those are all great questions. So we have multiple levels of associate. Uh, there's three different ones. All the buy-ins are, are slightly different because the back ends tend to be different. So yes, uh, upfront fee and then the back end split. So we are splitting deals. Um, but all of those deals, we're helping them build their company. So all those deals will be in, say, their LLCs. We're, we're helping them build up their portfolio, and then we're just uh, getting the, the back end from them and, and as we kind of coach them through the process. So it's, it's a little different than uh, probably your everyday consulting. Like, we're not just hopping on the phone with them for a half an hour a week and saying, like, hey, tell me what happened with you last week, and then answering their questions. No, ours is way more intensive where, yeah, everyone gets their weekly call, but then moving forward, it's as needed. So... Uh, if we're working on a deal, uh, like last week, I think I talked to the same guy. We work, we're working on three deals right now, probably every single day for around a half an hour to 45 minutes, uh, helping him from talking to the seller to working on options to uh, constructing the deal itself. And now we're going to start working on paperwork. Uh, and we do that with each and every one of our associates. So as you can see, by splitting deals on the back end, it's really incentivizing the entire team, including the associate, to get these deals done. Because it's not, you know, we don't, in some other aspects, people, it doesn't matter if they get deals done. But with us, everything is directly correlated with that. Uh, and I'll tell you why. It's because, well, we are doing a, a bunch of research and, you know, we've all studied, you know, all the top people um, and the, some of the top people have been around forever. So what we've noticed in the industry itself is there's a lot of people buying products and then there's not a lot of people doing deals. So, we noticed the number one thing in order to get deals done is implementation and how to do that. The best way is hands-on training. So now we have a product and then we have people doing deals because they're working with us in the trenches, hand in hand, significantly shorten their learning curve and getting them to build these businesses. It's been amazing to watch. And uh, that's, that's really what the associate level um, entails. Nice. I want to take a quick turn here before we get to our wrap up section and you mentioned that you're a bartender and a personal trainer. What a great combination of marketing strategy. What a horrible combination for life design strategy. <laughs> um, <laughs> You're telling me I lived it. Yeah, that's nuts. It's like, you know, you got to get the guy has to burn off the calories next morning. That's great. And you're always talking to people as a bartender. And there's your source of clients for the, the personal training. But the four hours worth of sleep kind of like kills the whole business model, I think. <laughs> But the reason that I'm going there is usually I find that most of the personal trainers that I know, and I train with a personal trainer still twice a week, a couple of times on my own, they also were trainers. So I'm assuming you worked out then and are still probably working out? Yes. Exercise and meditation are two huge things that keep me going each and every day. So I'm trying to do at least one or the other every single day. Exercising in the gym is like my sanctuary. So 
Uh, that's the way I stay calm, cool, and collected. That's how I release my energy, and it's also how I clear my head. Yeah, and the reason I ask and the reason I'm leading into that is I think that's a, a not so often talked about component of being successful in real estate. I was listening to Jeb Blunt. He was talking about emotion and sales and keeping your emotions in check. And I also, just like you, either I meditate every day or I do a workout. I, like I said, I try to. I'm sure there's a few days here and there. Uh, some days I do both. Some days I have to no time or whatever. Life shows up. But I've recognized, especially over the past three months that I've been more and more consistent with it, I'm able to keep my emotions in check, whether we're doing a deal and we're making $100,000 or whether we're doing a deal and it's taking 18 months and we were supposed to be done construction in three months and we've had four bad contractors on that deal. And a lot of those negative, challenging, you know, the anger wants to boil over, yet because I'm meditating, I can you know, I can shut off that deal as soon as I'm done on the phone with it and move on and be effective. I have to show up the next minute, the next phone call. I have to show up in my business and I better be emotionally centered because if I'm if I'm all charged up because we're, you know, 15, 20, 30, 40 thousand dollars in the hole on something we shouldn't have been. I'm not going to be able to function where I need to function when I jump on to that next deal, that next call and, and just stay like from event to event to event you know, emotionally centered. And that's like the meditation piece. And as far as, you know, being in the gym, whether it's some cardio, whether it's some weight training, I remember when I first got in the business, I was 26, 27, 28. And I didn't, I was not in the gym. And like, I, I started that in 2012. So I was, you know, 32 when I started working out. And I've noticed, you know, that along with my choice not to smoke cigarettes or not to do any other kind of, I don't drink, I don't do any of that since 2012. And I've noticed that like my ability to show up and continue to build my business and be consistent has grown at the same time as my habit of going to the gym and just my all around holistic health and lifestyle growing. And I'm curious to know whether I assume that that's kind of been the same for you. And do you recognize that maybe in any of the associates that you have or any other business partners around you, or maybe you share your own experience? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, health is, is a huge, a huge aspect of anybody's life, not all in their business. I mean, if you don't have the energy to show up, you know, day in and day out for your business and, you know, us being entrepreneurs, it's not like we're working a nine to five. You don't just get to go home and forget about the business for the next 12 hours. You know, you're still grinding out. We're still, you know, sun up to sun down. So with that being said, yeah, it's, it's, it's an absolute huge impact on, uh, on everybody's lives. Uh, and if you if you do it right, and if you are healthy, then it's going to directly impact you positively in, in every aspect of your life. Um, there's a couple of things. So as far as it's like changing your mindset. So this it just reminded me of a story of when I was like first making calls about three years ago. I was getting a bunch of no's. So what I would do every time I was getting frustrated on the phone is I would jump down and I'd do some push-ups uh, because you can alter your mind by doing physical activities. Like if you like raise your hands over your head and you start yelling, I guarantee you're going to start laughing at some point in time. So <laughs> you can easily affect, you can easily affect the state of mind by doing something physical. So that is, that's a huge thing there. And then also if you almost go the opposite, it's a, you know, like when you have a long night of drinking, then all of a sudden that leads to the morning and you ha you make bad decisions, eat bad food. And then that day you probably don't work out and then you get into this, this slump. So not only as, not only as you increase your health, you get more energy and you get stronger and you can drive this business. But if you do the opposite and you find a slump, you know, negative attracts negative in a way and you, it, that starts to propel. So you just got to recognize if you're, if you're not in that state of mind where you're constantly moving forward and you're working on your health and your mind, then you just got to realize that, you know, if you make that pivot now, even if you're not there, that, you know, there's huge potential uh, if, you, if you start focusing on you and your health. Yeah, and, and the last little thought I'll share on this, I started by walking my sister's dog around the block, just one time around the block, and that was that was the extent, and then it was, you know, around six or seven blocks, and then it was like, I'm walking the dog every day for two miles, twice a day, and then, you know, after a month or two of that, all of a sudden, I joined the gym, and it was like one thing grew to another, but taking that first, you know, awkward step out the door with the dog was where it started for me, and now it's, you know squatting 365. Sounds like you need a dog. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Could be the answer. I do have one now. Yeah. Okay. 
That's awesome. Yeah, no, that, that's huge. I, I love that story. I'm glad that actually came up because I'm a huge passionate when it comes to health and uh, exercise. Um, definitely a huge advocate for that. So I'm super excited that I could put on a, that I could put on this podcast. Yeah, for sure. I appreciate you sharing your perspective there. So I have a question that I want you to answer, if you don't mind, two different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, one would be to somebody who is like just getting started, maybe in real estate. Uh, these books don't have to be real estate related, but also maybe one to somebody like myself who's been at the business for 13 years and has a you know, pretty strong momentum to two book recommendations, one for the beginner and one for you know those who are kind of a little bit longer in the game if you have them. Sure. So I think throughout this entire process, whether you're just getting started or you're 12 years in the business, we always need to constantly work on our mindset. Uh, I actually have a poster right behind me or it's a canvas that says mindset is everything. And it actually has a goldfish and then above the water is a shark fin. So it's, it's all about how your perspective and building that mind. So and this book actually has a goldfish on it too. So this is almost for both, and, and, and I hate to do that to you, but this is for both the beginner and for and for the, the person that's been in there for a long time. The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks. I don't know if you've ever read that read that before. No, not yet. It's actually a goldfish on it, too. And really what it is is it talks about is you were just talking about how you do absolutely everything for your business, and eventually you need to start passing some, some things off to other people. But uh, what it talks about in the book and what the ultimate aspect is, is it's all about – living in your zone of genius. So finding out exactly what your zone of genius is, like what you're passionate about, uh, what you're probably the best at compared to everyone around you. And then, and then working in that zone of genius all the time. Cause it, it not only makes you more happy, but it also is going to allow you to propel yourself a lot further in life because that's where you need to be. Um, so that's a good book. Get, uh, the big leap. And then you were mentioning meditation, so I, I figured I'd throw this out there. Neither one of these are are uh, real estate based, but both very successful people who uh, who wrote them. Um, the Surrender Experiment by Michael Singer. All right. Have you read that one yet? No, no. I'm writing them both down at the order of them. Yeah. So the Surrender Experiment is Michael Singer. He's the CEO uh, and one of the founders of WebMD. So that so he's a billionaire now. But he started out as like this yogi who was like trying to get like rid of the world and like would just like meditate and like didn't want to be bothered by anyone. <laughs> and his whole, his whole, this whole book, and it's really cool because it's a, it's a true story. So this whole book is about how he decided to surrender himself to the universe instead of trying to place his will and his desire on everything and how he wanted all these certain outcomes and where he wanted to be. What he then did instead was he, um, you know, opened himself to the universe and then allowed things to come into his life. And then as they did, it's, it's almost doesn't do it. Uh, it doesn't do it justice, but it's almost like that. Yes, man mentality in a way it's um, if you continue to, to push forward and you allow the universe to break things into your life, it's actually going to propel you more quickly. And it's also going to bring uh, you a life of way more joy uh, than you probably could have imagined in your head and what you were trying to like force on the universe. Nice. I know it's a little woo woo, but it's 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 done a lot for me. And he has other books as well um, that are all about mindset and and surrender and meditation and things like that. That's fantastic. I appreciate that both of these weren't you know the common real estate books, and the common real estate books are all great that we hear a lot of on this show and on a lot of other shows. But I appreciate that you came from a different direction with these, Zach. Thank you. So. If you could go back, you're uh, heading back to your 18-year-old self. What would be the crown jewel of wisdom that you'd share with your younger self? I would really, I would start working on myself a heck of a lot earlier in life. Uh, I didn't start getting into like personal development or reading or journaling or any of that until I was probably like in my early 20s. So if I could go back, I know I'm only 28 now, but if I could go back to my 18 year old self was 10 years ago, I would tell myself to start working on that like immediately. I would start, I, I started with uh, Bob Proctor, who was amazing. Uh, Joe Vitale was just at our last event and he spoke. I, I got to meet and hang out with him. So those are two really good people on, on working on personal development. So I would just go back to myself and I would say, hey, you got to start working on yourself now because I can't even imagine if I added four more years to this momentum that I have right now and that we have as a family and a company right now, if I could have built upon that four years earlier, uh, I just, 
I probably would need a telescope to see where I was. <laughs> nice. Well said. So if anyone's listening, uh, if, would you like to first make a request of the audience as you're sharing your contact information or maybe some websites if people want to check out more info about you? Yeah, why don't we do this? Uh, I'd love to give away our free Amazon best-selling book, which was uh, Real Estate on Your Terms. And I, and I mean, I, I want to give it away for free. I definitely don't want to pay. Uh, I don't want to have you pay for shipping or handling. Uh, and then once you get on there, I'll give that link in one second. I do just want to let you guys know ahead of time we are doing, we have our new book coming out where me, Chris, and Nick co-authored along with uh, uh, 23 other top real estate investors from around the country. Um, and the new book is coming out. Uh, that will be up on Amazon probably in March. But if you go ahead and buy the, uh, you go ahead and uh, get this free book now, you'll, you'll be placed on that list and be one of the first people to know about it. Um, and that will be the 25 new rules of real estate. Um, it's it's going to be amazing. It's going to be packed. Um, just saw the transcript. It's, it's going to be a killer book. But for now, uh, I definitely want to give you our, our Amazon bestselling book, which is, you write this down, uh, this is the website. It's free, S-R-E-C book.com. That's free, F-R-E-E, S-R-E-C, B-O-O-K.com. Uh, amazing book, real estate on your terms. Take a look at that and uh, enjoy it. Cool. Hey, Zach, I really appreciate you bringing a ton of value, blocking out the world with us here for the last hour or so. Uh, thank you for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Dan. I uh, very much appreciate it and uh, humbled for being on your show. And thank you for listening to this episode of the REI Diamond Show. Keep an eye out for the next episode. We have retired NFL New York Giants player Hakeem Velez join us here to discuss his transition from professional football uh, to life as a full-time real estate investor. You definitely won't want to miss that one. Now, are you interested in a pre-release of the next episode before the email goes out? When you subscribe on YouTube or one of the podcasting apps, including iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher, you'll receive an advance notification as soon as episodes are published, as opposed to having to wait until Saturday when the email is sent. Prefer the email instead? Just head over to reidiamonds.com and sign up. I am always buying houses, and I am always looking for deals in Chicago, Atlanta, and Philadelphia, so if you have a deal preferably one I can fix and flip, please send it over. You can contact me directly at reidiamonds.com using that form. Also, from that site, you can check out available profitable real estate deals and the entire archive of REI Diamond Show, totaling more than 127 content-rich, money-making, idea-packed episodes. Are you an accredited investor? Interested in short-term passive mortgage investment opportunities with double-digit returns? Head over to fundrehabdeals.com to check out available high-yield investment opportunities. This concludes this episode. Thank you again for tuning in to the REI Diamond Show. Dan Breslin here, signing off. Thank you for listening to this episode of the REI Diamond Show with Dan Breslin. To receive email notifications of new weekly episodes, sign up at www.reidiamonds.com.